happen. And we are going to ver verses 24 to 26. Thank you for turning there this morning. Hebrews chapter number 11, verses 24 to 26. Now the message will start off quite quickly and, and be uh, perhaps more energetic at the beginning, but then we are going to slow down where God slows Moses down. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 to 26. And uh, please stay with me this morning as we look at this very important subject in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 24, the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season." esteeming the reproaches of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time that we can spend in the Word of God. Lord, we ask now that you would still our hearts. Lord, that our eyes would be upon you, just in the same way as we've been reminded your eyes are upon us. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for who you are. And we pray now that you would teach us by Moses' example. Lord, you've included this portion of the scripture for our admonition. You've put it there to challenge us, Lord, and to help us to see the things that are above are much, much more worth living for than the things on this earth. Lord, help us to understand the depth of the teaching in these verses. Help us, dear God, to make decisions this morning. And I pray, Lord, most of all for the young people here today, that when they come to years, they would make the choices that would glorify your name. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, many of you may know that we lived for four and a half years all the way up in tropical far north Queensland. And while we were living in Cairns, one of our favourite places to go for a family day was up on top of the mountains to a little place which was called the Australian Butterfly Sanctuary. And that was in fact the largest butterfly aviary in all of Australia. And it was an absolutely amazing place. There were at least 2,000 spectacular butterflies crammed into a tiny little aviary up there on the tablelands. If you walked in especially with colorful clothing and they advise you to wear a colorful hat, isn't that right children? They would land on your head and we took a lot of photos there and they would land on your shoulder and you would walk around. Yes, it was very, very hot and humid, but it was a spectacular array of the beautiful creation, <clears throat> excuse me, of God. My favorite butterfly was the Ulysses butterfly, which is the, the emblem of the city of Cairns, and it is a brilliant blue. And when it catches the sunlight, it looks like it has been lit up by electricity. It glows radiantly in the day's sun. Well, one of the most fascinating parts of the Avery was a trip to the laboratory. And that's where you can see the actual uh, process of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. A very fascinating place I'd encourage you to visit if you're up that way. Now the process of the change between a caterpillar and a butterfly is what we describe as a metamorphosis. We understand that a caterpillar reforms itself on the inside and what is inside eventually comes out. Now that is an absolute miracle of God, wouldn't you agree? Amen. An absolute miracle. It seems sudden when that butterfly miraculously appears, but isn't it true that change has been taking place for a while? It is a change that was taking place within. Now, these passages that we've read this morning describe to us what we could call the metamorphosis of Moses. You see, church family, there was a time in Moses' life that what was inside his heart suddenly came out. And what a change. Amen. You see, it was then that Moses made some of the most important decisions of his life. And these decisions, listen carefully, young people, not only affected the course of the rest of his life, 
but also the course of the lives of all those around him. Verse 24 says, by faith Moses, when he was come to years. How many years was that? Well, Acts chapter 7 tells us that he was a full 40 years old. We know that he was single. Isn't that right? We know that he was an adult. Now, for personal reasons, I'd like to say that he was a young adult this morning. And if you're wondering why, well, you can ask me later. But the Bible says, when Moses was come to years, when he was at the point of making the biggest decisions of his life, what did he have to do? Well, Moses had to choose with whom would he cast his lot. Would he cast his lot with Egypt? Or would he cast his lot with the people of God? Would he look to claim the promises of God? Or would he then claim the lusts of the world? You see, Moses had to make a choice. And young people, let me challenge you this morning that there are some decisions that are just around the corner that you need to make that will determine the course for the rest of your life. And the most dangerous life stage for a Christian is this life stage as a young adult. Why is that? Because you are making the biggest decisions with the least experience. Amen. That's why this is a very important message. Maybe you've guessed our theme for this month. Well, it is this. Lord, revive the next generation. Revive the next generation. We began with Father's Day, amen? And that's where it begins. It begins in the home. But this morning, young people, God is asking you the question. What choices are you going to make? When you come to years, what are you going to do? Well, I want to encourage you this morning to follow the example of Moses. And let's look at three steps of faith. Just three steps of faith that Moses took that led him ultimately to the blessing and eternal reward that Moses is enjoying right now. All right, are you ready? Have a look in verse number 24. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 24. Notice, first of all, Moses did the impossible. Moses did the impossible. He refused Egypt. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, brethren, this is an amazing statement to us this morning. Think about what Moses refused. Have a look in verse number 25. The Bible said something about the pleasures of sin for a season. Think about all the temptations that Moses must have faced. Today, many young people are ensnared by the lusts of the flesh. They're on the internet. They're looking at pornography. They're ensnared by the perversity and the wickedness of this world. At one click of the button, they can see all the wickedness that is available today on the screen. But think about Moses for a moment. The son of Pharaoh's daughter, well, for him, it was all at the click of his fingers. He could have anything he wanted to the extent that he wanted. All the pleasures of Egypt were right before him. What about the treasures of Egypt? Notice verse 26. The Bible describes the greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Do you see that in verse 26? Now, we're not talking about just a few coins this morning. We are talking about the treasures of Egypt. We are talking about Moses as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. He would have been in line to receive Pharaoh's own treasure. And brethren, isn't it true that centuries later, the world is still talking today about the treasures of Egypt? Hey, people have died to try and find treasure in Egypt. Egypt was overflowing with gold, overflowing with wealth. And the riches of the world and the kingdoms of the world were right at the fingertips of Moses. The pleasures of the world, the treasures of the world. Hey, what about the possibilities of the world? Look with me, please, in the book of Acts chapter number 7. Acts chapter number 7 and verse 22. Here we read a bit more detail about Moses' upbringing. A bit more detail about what happens next. Look in verse 22, please, in Acts chapter number 7. Thank you for turning there. The Bible says, And Moses was learned 
in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Now, young people, look up here this morning. Think about all the possibilities of Egypt. Now, this was no ordinary wisdom that Moses had. This was the wisdom that invented mathematics. Yes, the Greeks refined it, but the Egyptians invented it. Think about the design of the pyramids, the most spectacular structures ever built on the face of the earth. Think about the wisdom of the Egyptians, the wisdom that invented medical surgery. Think about the intricate embalming process that they understood and took practice with in order to bury their dead. Think about the first and incredibly complex pictographic language that was ever written, the hieroglyphic language of the Egyptians, and you'll just begin to understand the possibilities that lay at the feet of Moses. Moses, the Bible says, was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now, that is no small statement. Moses had it all, would you agree? He had the pleasures, he had the treasures, he had the possibilities. Now, young people, listen carefully. Here's a question. When Moses was come to years and he could have had it all, which one did he choose? Which one did he choose? The Bible says he refused it all. The Bible says that Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, Moses did the impossible. He refused Egypt. And Christian, listen carefully, God expects nothing less from you and I today. Have a look, please, in the book of 1 John, chapter number 2. 1 John, chapter number 2. Moses did the impossible. He refused Egypt. What about you and I today? 1 John, chapter number 2, and verse 15. Let's read it together out loud, shall we? 1 John, chapter 2, and verse 15. Are we ready? 1 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Notice verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, my, isn't that the pleasures of this world? The lust of the flesh. Hey, those perverse images on the screen. Young people, that includes the immoral relationships that you will be tempted to enter into. Hey, that also includes the perversity, the thoughts that enter into our mind that we entertain sadly on a daily basis. The lusts of the flesh. Young people, some of you need to take some action this morning. Amen? Some of you need to take some action to refuse the lusts of this world, the pleasures of this world, the perversity of this world. Yes, Moses did it by faith, by the grace of God. He refused it all. And yes, you can do it too, young Christian. Absolutely. You can be accountable for what you do on your phone. Uh, you can be accountable for the decisions you make. If you're in home, if you're still living at home, praise God. That's your safety net. Amen. That's your accountability place. Maybe you need a friend to make yourself accountable too. Why? So you don't give in to the lusts of the flesh. Notice what the Bible says next. Verse number 16. And the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes. Boy, does that not describe, therefore, the treasures of this world, the luxuries? Doesn't the world just want to convince us that we need more? More pleasures, more treasures, more money, more things, more of the world that more of the world has to offer. Brand names, technology, whatever we want. Isn't that right? Hey, that's what advertising is all about. Young adult, listen carefully. Don't fall into the snare of covetousness, of riches. The Bible describes, it, uh, describes covetousness as a snare that will choke up your young life, that will set you on a direction away from the blessings of God, away from the promises of God, away from the great plan that God has for your life. The lust of the eyes. What about next in verse 16, the pride of life? 
I believe that relates to the possibilities of this world. The possibilities of this world. Yes, young people, this world offers unlimited opportunities, unlimited possibilities, unlimited education. Whatever you want, if you work hard enough, you can get it. And that is a very temptation. Then that is a very tempting possibility, is it not? The education of the world is what Moses had. He could have been anyone who he wanted to be. He could have been popular. Many of our young people are stuck in the pride of life and they don't even realize it. I want that career. I deserve that position. I crave that recognition in this world. You know what that is? That is nothing but sinful pride. Moses could have had it all, but he refused it all. The Bible says these are not of the Father, but of the world. You see, Moses knew that God had a plan for his life. Hey, he knew that much. Amen? Amen. Young person, do you know that much this morning? That God has a plan for your life? Do you remember what he said to Jeremiah? Before I formed thee in the womb, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Wow. What a calling. What a plan that God may have for you. You may not realize yet what it may be, but Christian, God wants you to make some decisions this morning. He wants you to refuse some things. He wants you to love not the world. You see, Moses realized he couldn't have both. He couldn't have God and he couldn't have Egypt at the same time. It was either one or the other. And when he was come to years, he cast his lot with the living God. And what about you? What about us as Christians this morning? We can't have both either. James chapter 4 verse 4 tells us, Ye adulterers and adulteresses. That is speaking of the Christian. The Christian who goes into the world is described as committing spiritual adultery against the one who has bought them with a price. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity against God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. My, what a statement. What a rebuke to you and I this morning when so often we drift off into the world and God says, I don't want you to love it anymore. It's taking you away from me, young person. The Bible says no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You see, it's impossible, Christian. What will you do when you come to years? Well, Moses did the impossible. Amen. By faith, he did the impossible. He refused Egypt. What about you? Well, notice secondly, back in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Are you still with me this morning? Now, this this is where things slow down for Moses a little bit in a moment. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 25. Not only did Moses refuse Egypt, he did the impossible. Notice, secondly, Moses chose the unthinkable. Moses chose the unthinkable. He chose to suffer the loss of all that he was. Verse number 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses chose the unthinkable, brethren. He chose to suffer the loss of all he was. And back in Acts chapter 8, that's described to us in verses 23 to 24. Let's turn back there for a moment. Thank you for going back to Acts chapter 7. Notice verse number 23. Acts chapter 7 and verse 23, the Bible says, And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Can you see this morning that there was something in Moses' heart? It was already there. The metamorphosis was taking place. Moses already refused Egypt in his heart. He was now going to visit his brethren. The Bible tells us in verse number 12, uh, excuse me, in verse number 24, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him 
and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Now, what did Moses do? Well, he saw one of them suffer. Exodus chapter 2 tells us he looked this way. He looked that way. He knew the consequences of the cost of murdering an Egyptian. Moses knew exactly what he was doing, brethren. He knew the cost of what would happen if he murdered the Egyptian. Isn't that right? He knew the price that he would pay. He knew what he would lose. Now, how Moses chose chose to reveal himself, we know was wrong. He shouldn't have murdered the Egyptian. How he chose to reveal himself was wrong. But what Moses did that day revealed exactly what was in his heart. You see, in one foul strike, Moses chose to suffer the loss of all that he had. In an instant, his rights were gone. Amen? In an instant, his ambitions were annihilated. In an instant, he identified with the people of God and he himself, by his own choice, brought himself down to the level of a common slave. Moses did the unthinkable. He chose to suffer the loss of all that he had and all that he was. In an instant. Do you see what he chose that day? He refused Egypt, but then secondly, he refused himself. He refused himself. Now, many times when we refuse ourselves, we think we're pretty spiritual. But after this, God had to take Moses much, much lower than Moses thought in order for him to be a vessel ready for the master's use. Notice in the, in the next verse, verse 25, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Now this was a shock to Moses. Hey, he thought they'd work it out. He thought they would realize then and there, here I am, I'm the, deliver- I'm the deliverer. God hath raised me up in the palace of Pharaoh, just like Esther, for such a time as this. And here I am. I'm ready to help you now, my people of God. And what did they do? Notice verse number 26. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove, or as they argued with each other, and would have set them at once again, saying, Sirs, are ye brethren? Why, why do ye wrong one to another? Verse 27. But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Well, now Moses is in trouble. His own people have now rejected him. And he fled into the wilderness with nothing, stripped of his entire identity. And at 40 years old, Moses would spend the next 40 years in the land of Midian. As God humbled Moses and brought Moses down to the very level, listen carefully, where there was now nothing between Moses and God. For 40 years, Egypt put themselves into Moses. And for 40 years, God would take Egypt out of Moses. Moses had to suffer the loss of all that he was. Yes, he refused Egypt, but now it was time to refuse himself. Young person, you might be here this morning and you might say, well, I thought it's enough to refuse the world. Isn't that enough to live for God? If I just say no to my flesh, if I just say no to to the lusts of the world and I make some decisions in purity and praise God that is right and praise God that is needful, that we don't look on some things and we make some standards and we set some principles in our home, amen, and we make some convictions as young people, but Christian, that is not enough. Yes, the world is our enemy and yes, the devil is our adversary, but there is an enemy within much more diabolical for the heart. Of man, the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You see, the greatest enemy that you have, young person, is your flesh, is yourself. And that was Moses' greatest enemy. Hey, as soon as he refused Egypt, what did he do? He tried to do God's will his way. 
And as soon as we refuse the world, watch out, young person. Guess who is the one who steps right in that gap that has been made? That wicked, sinful flesh. Wow. Oh my, Moses needed to be humbled. He needed to choose to suffer the loss of all things. And even when he made that choice, he did not fully understand where that would lead him. But don't be discouraged. It led him to the right place. Amen. It led him to the living God. But it did take some time. No young person. It's not just enough to refuse the world. You need to take the second step. The first step is to say no to Egypt. The second step is to say no to the flesh, to say no to self, to say no to your reputation, to say no to your plans, to say no to your dreams, so that there is nothing left between you and God except His perfect will for your life. You see, the Lord Jesus said unto His disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross daily and follow me. What a frightening truth, isn't it? That so often when we think we are at our most spiritual, we can be so full of ourselves. Here's a little illustration that I read once and I'd like to share with you. How many of you have ever driven down a country road and you've seen some deep ditches either side? Now, usually they're there so that when it rains, the runoff goes into the ditches and doesn't stay on the road. Now, as Christians, usually we live in one ditch or the other. Sometimes we're on the ditch of this side of life. We're in the world. Isn't that right? We're listening to the world's music. We're lusting after the world's things. We want the popularity. Hey, we want the treasures. We want the pleasures. Sometimes that's where we live as Christians. And perhaps, young person, God has challenged you in an area and you've made some decisions. But if you're not careful, once you repent of your sins, at times it's so possible and most likely than not that you'll run straight over the over the top of that road, slip down into the other side and you find yourself back in the ditch once again. And it's not the ditch of the world, but it's the ditch of the flesh and self. Why? Well, you see, this is where we think we're living for God. Uh, This is where, spiritually speaking, we surrender to God and then we begin to tell God how we're going to serve Him. Isn't that right? Oh, Lord, I'm surrendered to you. I've I've set some things aside. I've refused Egypt. But, Lord, I'm surrendered to you now. And this is what I want to do with my life. Wow. How many young people I've seen since I've been saved at the age of 25 and they've been growing up in a Christian home. They've been fed the word of God from birth, just like Timothy of old. Amen. And they haven't realized that God was preparing them as a Timothy. God was preparing them as a minister. God was preparing them for a preacher. But they rolled over the other side of the world back into the ditch of the flesh. And now they're telling God what they want to do with their lives. Lord, you haven't called me. Really, that's how you've been raised. You've been raised for the ministry and you don't even see it. What a terrible reality to live in the flesh. We tell God how we're going to serve him. We tell God when we're going to serve him. We tell God where we are going to serve him. And all we're doing is manifesting the reality that we are living our lives according to our sinful flesh. Now, the worst of it is when we see other Christians living in the world, you know what we do? Do you know what we do? we begin to look down at them. And we say, I can't believe they're doing that. I can't believe they're living that life of sin. And we despise them and we criticize them. You know what you've done, young person? You've gone from one ditch and you've ended up into the other. And that's not going to work either. Brethren, what will you do when you come to years? Young people, when it's time to make decisions as spiritual as they may seem. Has there ever been a time that you fully surrendered to God? Yes, as Moses did. And you were willing to suffer the loss of all that you desire for yourself. Now that's the next level. Can I put it that way bluntly? 
That is the next level kind of Christianity. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, that the carnal mind is enmity against God. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. We know we can't please God if we're living in the world, but that's, that's obvious, that's basic Christianity. But how much more so if we are living in the flesh? The subtleties of our own sinful nature are so deceptive, aren't they? Uh, Brother Nathan Bard put it beautifully this morning. So often we want to offer something to God, but we offer him our own self-will. We don't bring an offering that's pleasing to the Lord. We bring an offering that we want to bring to the living God. And then we're shocked when God doesn't accept it. And we're confused what went wrong. And all the while, what God is doing is simply humbling us like Moses of old. He's taking some time to take some things away. And maybe God is taking some things away this morning. Maybe God is closing some doors this morning. Maybe God is allowing some suffering into your life this morning. Why? Because he wants you to be like Moses. He wants you to be a a believer, a Christian who values nothing more than your relationship with the living God. So just like Moses, you would treasure most of all to be one whom the Lord knew face to face. God was molding Moses into a servant for his glory. Young person, are you willing to be reduced? We may go our way, but the way of the transgressor is hard. He will never leave us nor forsake us. I'm speaking from experience this morning. God will not let us go, amen, along the path of destruction without getting our attention. Christian, are you willing to lose your reputation? Are you willing to lose your rights? Are you willing to let go of your self-ambition? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do you know the only way that can be done? If you let go of yourself. That's the only way the gospel will spread around the world. That's only, it's the only way the Great Commission will be done, my friend. If we let go of ourselves, why is not the Great Commission being done today? Why aren't there more missionaries going out today? Because we're living in the flesh, that's why. Amen. We're in the ditch. Some of us have said no to the world. That's all well and good, but that's step one. What about over here? What about refusing ourselves? What about crying out to God? Lord, what will you have me to do? Oh, my. Well, the million-dollar question is, how can we tell if we're living in the flesh? If it's so diabolical? Well, here's one clue in, in Hebrews chapter 11. Thank you for staying with me this morning. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25. How do we know if we're simply living for ourselves and pretending to be spiritual? Well, I'd like to know the answer to that question. How about you? We can appear awfully spiritual on a Sunday. But how do we know if we're just living for ourselves? Hebrews 11 verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Well, here's one way we know whether we're living for ourselves. Young people, listen carefully. Are you choosing to suffer affliction with the people of God? That will reveal to you whether you're living for yourself or you are living unto God. To suffer affliction means to endure persecution together. And you see, Moses, when he was come to years, made it known very plainly to his people that I am willing to suffer with you. I am willing to suffer for you. I'm willing to lose everything that I could have and everything that I am to suffer the rest of my life for you and with you. Listen, he didn't just reveal himself as a Hebrew on that faithful day. Do you know what Moses was doing? Moses was was saying, for the rest of my life, I'm identifying with the people of God. I'm not going to be ashamed anymore of who I am. 
I'm not going to be ashamed of the living God. I'm going to follow the Lord and I'm going to be his servant. Now, he wasn't yet ready for that task. But he made that choice, didn't he? He made that choice. He made that choice to suffer affliction with the people of God. Listen, Christian, what is your relationship with the people of God? Are you a selfish Christian? Or are you a spiritual Christian? Have you ever dared to bear one another's burdens? Now, all of us have problems, don't we? And sometimes we try to avoid the problems of others. Isn't that right? Isn't that true? Well, the Bible tells us if we are spiritual and we are not living for self, we will be willing to suffer affliction with the people of God, to care enough about their suffering to bear ye one another's burdens. Isn't that true? A Christian, are you willing to weep with them that weep and rejoice with them that rejoice? That takes humility. That takes time. That takes sacrifice. It's an inconvenience to lower, lower ourselves down out of our own temporary happiness to a place where we can comfort one another, where we can encourage one another in the Lord. Isn't that right? Are we willing to suffer affliction with the people of God? Listen, young person, are you a Sunday-only Christian or are you a soul-winning Christian? Hey, there is a difference. The Bible says we are to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Are you going to hand out any tracts tomorrow, young people? Or are you just willing to be in church on a Sunday? Are you ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you ashamed to suffer reproach for his name's sake? Are you ashamed of the address on the back of the track which says, Cremium Bible, Baptist Church, come to a place where you can hear the gospel and be saved? Are you ashamed of our tracks this morning? Or are you willing to suffer affliction with the people of God? You know, when we go out to street ministry, It's good to do the right thing. But once again, as Brother Nathan mentioned this morning, we can do the right thing in the flesh. Isn't that right? We go out because it's right to do, but yet we have not chosen in our heart that we desire and want to suffer affliction with the people of God. And we esteem that greater riches than the world. You see, Moses made his choice, didn't he? He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. And that will tell you exactly what your relationship with Christ is like. Yes, it is an unthinkable choice unless, young person, listen carefully, you have given up all your rights to God. Unless you've given up all your rights to God, it is unthinkable. It is impossible to say no to the world if you're still hanging on to your rights, young person. It is unthinkable to say no to your flesh when you're hanging on to all your dreams and your reputation, young person. But Moses let it all go. Moses let it all go. And here's the reason why. Verse number 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Thirdly, Moses saw the invisible. He saw the eternal riches of Christ. Why should I let the world go as a Christian? And why should I let my flesh go as a Christian? Why should I say no to both? Why? Because we need to see the invisible this morning. We need to see with spiritual eyes what we can't see upon the earth. We need to see the eternal riches of Christ. The Bible says that Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasure in Egypt. What does that mean? Well, you see, Moses weighed things up. He judged that the worst suffering for Christ is greater riches than all that the world had to offer. Did you hear that? That doesn't make sense. Uh, Friend, that is unthinkable. That the worst suffering for Christ is greater riches than all that this world and its treasures and pleasures and possibilities has to offer. 
Why would he make that conclusion? This is what he esteemed. This is what he understood and made his decisions by. Why? Because by faith, he saw the invisible. You see, in verse number 25, Moses understood that sin only lasts for a season. You see, young people, Moses knew where sin would take him. Moses knew that it would take him away from God and he would lose things he could never get back. He would lose things now and in the eternity to come and would suffer shame before the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses knew where sin would take him. And young adult, don't be fooled. Sin will always take you further than you want to go and will lead you wor- leave you worse off than you ever wanted to be. Sin only lasts for a season. Everything you lustfully desire this morning, Christian, is going to end very quickly once you have it. It lasts only for a season. Notice in verse number 26, he saw the eternal riches of Christ. For he had respect, the Bible says, unto the recompense of the reward. The word respect means that he saw the reward of Christ. He saw the reward of eternity. And because what he saw by faith, he turned away from what the world had to offer. He turned away from all his desires had to offer. And he fixed his eyes on God and he saw the eternity to come. Christian, that's the decision you need to come to. You must come to. Friend, Jesus Christ is coming again. The Bible says the Lord said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give unto every man according as his work shall be. Christ is coming again. It may be morning, it may be noon, it may be evening, it may be soon. It may be in the twinkling of an eye right now. The Lord is coming. Have you made some choices, young people? What will you do when you come to years? We see Moses fixed his eyes on heaven, where the least reward is greater riches than all the gain and all the glory of this present world. And you will only ever be able to see that if you see the invisible. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, and we're almost done. And they that be wise shall shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Just imagine, young person, if God's creation is so glorious, if what we see with our eyes is so unbelievably glorious then just imagine what God's eternal rewards will be like. Hey, we don't think about that much, do we? That's why we live in the ditch of the world, isn't it? That's why we live in the ditch of of the flesh. We think we need to try to get what God so already richly offers us in eternity. And all he asks is, would you deny yourself? Would you say no to the world? Will you say no to the flesh, young person? Make some decisions this morning. We need to look away from everything else and look to eternity like Moses with the eyes of faith. Hey, and then you'll get out of the ditch and then you'll be on the main road of life, amen? And then you'll be on the highway of blessing and then you'll be on the highway of the will of God and then you'll be in the right standing with Christ and then you won't be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ when you stand before the Lord and he desires to honor you and reward you and you can praise him in return for all eternity for what God has done in your life oh my Christian don't stay in the ditch this morning what will you do when you come to years Moses saw the invisible the eternal riches of Christ and that's why he chose the unthinkable to suffer the loss of everything that he was and everything he dreamed he would be even When he tried to do God's will in his own way, he lost that too. And therefore he did the impossible. He refused the world. In a moment we're going to have an invitation. Young people, make some decisions this morning. Moses made some choices. God did not do those choices for him. Moses made some choices. He took the long view down the path of life 
And he could see where the wrong choices would take him. What about you? Can you see from the word of God all that lays before you? All the potential and all the peril, all the possibilities of the world and all the preciousness that is in Jesus Christ. The eternal rewards of the Lord. What will we miss out if we make the wrong choices this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the example of Moses. Lord, we thank you for this brief glimpse into the choices that Moses made. Uh, Lord, we thank you for how you worked in his life. We thank you that you had a wonderful plan. And Lord, you had a wonderful place for him to be. And yes, Lord, there were times of great testing. There were times of great loss. There, was, there were times of great purging. But Lord, you did a work in his life. And you used him, Lord, to change the generation that he was in for your glory. Lord, we pray for our young people this morning. Lord, many of them are coming to that date when they will come to years and have to make some great decisions. Lord, we pray for our young people this morning that they will make the right choices. And Lord, they need your grace and your wisdom to do so. They need your boldness and your power and your courage to do so. And Lord, as this invitation begins, we pray, Lord, that you would hear our prayers and work in our lives for your glory. As the music begins to...